I'm Sir Tap Tap, and let's review Terraria. This is a very fun little sandbox game. If you haven't heard of it, you'll understand it a bit better in a second. Um, so let's just start with creating a new character. I'm so original with my names. Um, one weird thing about the creating a character, um, I understand the RGB value thing, so I know how to work these little sliders, and you know, I can make myself have green hair here. But uh, for most users, you really should just let me pick, like, green, blue, brown, whatever. Um, lots of, like, brown is an example that most people aren't going to know how to do. You have it set by default to brown, but yellow is another one where people might be like, how do I get to that with this? It's nice to have an advanced color editor, I guess. Uh, it's not the biggest deal, but it'd be nice to just have that, you know, simple color picking. Uh, a funny thing is, no matter what you pick, um, once you get armor and stuff, this uh, this is all practically invisible anyway. So, whatever. I just need to be testy. So, the game lets you make up to five worlds. I'm not sure why you're limited to five. It seems pretty arbitrary, and it really would be nice to be able to make five, or more than five, because um, I really don't need to. I only made this example world because I need an example world, but there's really not much reason to limit that, um, especially if people are going to have, like, a server they host with friends and, you know, multiple things, which I have had. But uh, the game starts off... Uh, I kind of like how the game starts off with no explanation, but you kind of know what to do. You've got an axe, you've got trees. Use the axe on the trees, you can figure stuff out. The game also gives you a guide... But he's extremely useless. Um, he just gives you completely random advice. Um, that's kind of helpful to know at the beginning, but uh, I think he actually has a set order of stuff he says. But just clicking through all of this is painful. Especially because his dialogue window re changes sizes, so if I just want to click through I have to move around. But it'd be really nice if the tutorial was more structured, because this is just you know, random verbal diarrhea. He is telling you important stuff, but he may be telling you a bunch of crap that you already know, and there may be stuff he knows that you don't know, but how do you find that information? Um, what I really like is a guided tutorial where, um, well, more of an unguided tutorial where, you know, you get tool tips where it's like, um, you know, oh, you're trying to use an axe on dirt. You have to use a pickup. On, or a pickaxe on dirt. Dirt does not respond well to pickup lines, so don't use a pickup. But yeah, it'd be nice if there were like little things that guide you along. When the guy, when the game knows you're making a mistake, like if you're trying to use a pickaxe on a material you can't break with that pick, a little tool tip in the bottom or something that says, "Hey, you need to use X to break that instead of Y." Uh, the combat starts off simple enough. Don't murder bunnies, jerk. One thing I never understood, your starter axe does way less damage than your starter pick. And at the same time, it's way slower. So it makes a really terrible weapon. It's, um, it's not the biggest deal, but it's like, shouldn't an axe hurt more than a pickaxe? It should be a more effective weapon. But uh, I really like how the crafting works in this game because, um, you know, it's clear enough what's going on here. It says crafting. So that's nice. And, uh, you know, you can just see what you can make, and it's you can see what materials will be used. And you don't have to know the recipes beforehand, which is really nice, because you can just collect a bunch of crap. You know, I assume that wood and stone may make something. Um, and then you can just check your crafting materials to see what you can actually make. Though it'd be sort of nice if these would explain more what they do for the starting player, but... Generally, you can guess what stuff does, you know. I would expect the bow to shoot arrows at things. Turns out it does actually shoot arrows. So, for the most part, lots of the game works without explanation. And But there are some parts where it really does not, and that's where the user could use more guidance. The weapons at the start of the game are absolutely terrible, because... If we can find another enemy... The pickaxe beats the crap out of any of the weapons you can make at the start. The bow is okay, but uh, it's sort of 
You know, the starter player is not going to have a ton of arrows. Uh, I need a monster to kill. But, yeah, for the longest time, I just used my pickaxe as a weapon because it is so annoying that with weapons you have to constantly click to keep attacking. And it's like, they're not so much superior that you need to make them more awkward to use to balance them out. You're just making them frustrating, and there's really no point for that. In fact, in the later weapons, it really causes some balance issues, but I'll get to that later. The main problem with that is that weapons seem completely useless at the start, because, I mean, my pickaxe is better than the sword. So, why bother with the swords? Ah, here we go. See, watch what the pickaxe does to this guy. It works better on an even level, but... It pretty much tears enemies apart pretty easy. Which, it is nice to be able to defend yourself at the start, so... And, you know, tougher enemies, you know, you can't kill with a pickaxe. Well, not efficiently. But it'd be really nice if you could just hold the button and constantly attack. But the digging and stuff works pretty intuitively. Uh, it's nice that you keep the weapons simple, so you can just use pickaxe to break through most bricks. And if it's obviously wood, you use the axe. That makes sense. The one thing that doesn't make as much sense is that you use the hammer to break background objects. Once you grasp that concept, um, it's easy to just remember, oh, it's a background thing I need to break. So I need to use the the hammer, but at the start it's like, why would you, like, uh, let's just make a hammer here. Hammer. So, yeah, let's say we want to break this dirt back wall here. At first you might not know how you can do that, but you can use the hammer to break anything in the background, pretty much. Let's see if we can let a little bit of light in here. So, the biomes are another thing I'd want to cover. The I really like the grass, you know, the whatever grassy land biome here. I love the trees and everything. It, it feels a little alive, the grass actually growing, and the... Sometimes vines can grow from hanging, like, overhangs and stuff. But uh, some of the other biomes are less interesting, like this desert here. The desert is really boring, but uh, I guess that makes sense. It's just... Bleh. It'd be nice if there were some cactuses or maybe some special enemies in the desert. It's pretty much just sand and rocks, which desert should be sand and rocks, but... Uh, some palm trees, a little bit of sparse life would liven it up a bit. Uh, one thing I do like is the fall damage. Well, the fall damage is sort of interesting. As you see, I fell a large distance there without getting hurt. It is pretty much a platformer and how you move. But if you fall from enough height... no, oh, that was not enough height. You do take a little bit of damage. The damage fall um, cut off is pretty sharp. Once you start to take damage, you start to take a lot of damage. Stupid thing. Yeah, it's... Unless you're in a cave, it can be pretty hard to actually take damage from falling. Unless you jump off a high cliff or something. And I do like how the sand just falls. Sort of a pain to get into this cave, though. Uh, another thing I really like about the grassland, the well, the surface biome, pretty much, is that you're pretty much limited on the number of caves you got here. Um, there are only a few caves, and they're, most of them are pretty dang deep, so you don't have to wander around looking for a cave that you can actually, like, explore or anything. So that's very nice. This is a case where limiting your options to, you know, the significant ones is very, very helpful. Because you see... You pretty much get very few caves, and almost all of them are going to be really deep, and they'll go pretty far underground. And because of the 2D perspective, you actually see a lot more of a cave than you would if it was 3D. And um, you can see through, you can kind of see through walls, basically, which allows us to do some stuff we couldn't. Like, if something looks like a dead end, but there's a room just past it, you can actually just see right into that room and just break into it, which is something I have to do in caves pretty often. For instance, right here, there is a cave, and 
since I can see into this room just barely with just enough light, I can actually see that I can continue digging into here. So that's very nice. The 2D perspective also keeps things simple for moving and combat, so that's actually very nice. But uh, let's just let this character die here, and I'll take a peek on my main character, so you can see some of the weapons and such. Um, one weird thing about the game was that initially you couldn't pause it, you just had to exit, you had to leave the window to pause it. Now it has this thing called auto-pause, and what that means is that when you open the inventory screen, the game pauses. But I initially didn't know what the hell auto-pause meant. So, that's sort of weird. Um, it should say, like, inventory, pause in inventory or something. Or pause it when the menu is open, because, uh, I just, you say auto-pause, and it's like, what, what does that mean? Auto-save, you know, makes sense. People are familiar with auto-saving. And it is very nice that it does that. It didn't use to auto-save. Let's take a peek at some of the weapons. I think I saved them here. Yes, I did. There are lots of... There's a big variety of weapons, and I really like that in this game. Um, there's also a very nice variety of accessories. Um, I find myself switching accessories fairly often. So that's really nice. Let's just take a peek at some of the best weapons here. I have too much junk. This game, you will have way too much stuff if you're a pack rat like me. But, uh, let's just take a peek at a few of the weapons here. Um, a big, big problem with the weapons is the click spam thing. This is the Muramasa, and it's one of the very few weapons that you can just hold down the click button and you attack. Then there's the Fiery Sword, which is supposed to be, like, the best weapon. It at least seems so, and it's got nice reach, but you have to keep clicking and clicking and clicking. And it's really not that much better than the Muramasa, especially due to its slow attack rate. It's not like it would be broken or anything if I could just hold down the button. It's really just a convenience issue. You should really not make these weapons frustrating to use, because people like me will not use them, and... Now, frustration is a big thing in games. If you frustrate your user, they may just quit and never play again. You don't want that. So yeah, most of these weapons really suffer from the having to click thing. That's why I don't use most of them. Um, there are some other issues. For instance, some weapons, like the mini shark, are painfully like underpowered. Oh, I don't have any ammo. The mini shark takes forever to kill any sort of boss enemy because of, well, anything with defense the mini shark does like two damage to. So it takes forever to kill any sort of boss. And it also eats ammo like crazy. And then there's the star cannon, which is pretty much the opposite problem. It's ridiculously powerful. Um, it does like 60 or 70 damage per attack. Let's just see. 75 damage. So it deals insane damage. The ammo is really rare to you to find, but uh, what I would really like, a balancing thing they did is that the stars no longer drop when you shoot stuff. Yeah, see, 75 damage. So you can't retrieve the stars like you can uh, when you shoot arrows in the game. You can pick them back up usually. What I think would be nice is maybe like cut the damage in like freaking half or something and make it so you can retrieve the stars after you shoot them because... This is basically just really broken, and it encourages people to either, like, waste a ton of time to get crazy amounts of stars, or just use an inventory editor to give themselves tons of stars and cheat. It'd be nice if you could just retrieve them, and they just weren't so brokenly overpowered that, you know, it's necessary for that. It's, it's a way to balance it, but I don't think it's the right way to balance it. Um, uh, one accessory I really love are the Hermes boots. There are several accessories, like the rocket boots here, that let you get around better. I really love that. Because being able to get around is, like, uh, at, as important or more important than, you know, killing stuff. Because if it takes forever to get anywhere, I'm bored, I'm gonna leave. Oh, and, uh, another thing with the weapons, the mana-powered weapons are really underpowered. They're really weak, and oftentimes really awkward to use to boot. 
I think they could use, like, if you boosted every mono weapon's damage up, like, 50%, they would probably still be, like, half worthless. Um, one problem is with the Star Fury here. If you're underground or inside of any structure ever, the stars never reach anything. It'd be really nice if they went through blocks, but they hit enemies. You know, I understand not making them 100% penetrative to damage, like, freaking everything on screen, but this thing is completely useless underground like this. So, yeah. It's just total junk. Pretty much anywhere except on the surface, and on the surface, there's usually nothing that special to kill. Then there's weapons like the Flame Lash, which does pretty crazy damage, but it's so weird to use. Because I gotta move the mouse around and blah blah blah. The mono weapons are just kind of crap. So what we're in here is called the Dungeon. The Dungeon is one of the parts of the game where if you're a new player and you haven't read the wiki, you're like, what the hell, because... There's usually this old guy walking around out here, and he says some random crap. And if you talk to that old guy at night, he turns into a giant freaking boss and probably kills you. And you're just like, what the hell? But you see this thing in here, and you try to go down here. And then, if you haven't killed the old guy, giant freaking skulls come out of nowhere to kill you, and you're just like, what the hell? Um, a little bit of explanation is really important there, and what the old guy says is really cryptic. It would be very nice if there was, like, um, well, like a tooltip would be ideal, just saying, oh, you died because you didn't kill that boss or something. It's not immediately apparent that, that, that you need to fight the old man to actually get in the dungeon. You're just like, um, the game randomly decided to kill me. That's fun. I love when games randomly decide to kill me. There are a few moments where the game gets a bit too odd, like where you're like, Without the wiki, you're just like, what do I do? I don't get it. And, you know, as a game maker, you really need to minimize that. Another case is in the corruption. There's this material that you can't break with a normal pickaxe. You need a better pickaxe to break it. It'd be neat that if you were trying to break that with a normal pickaxe, it gave you a little tool tip that said, oh, you need dynamite or something else to break this. Because you may just think you can't break that period and you just give up. And if you just um, if you just give up, then you're actually missing out on a big part of the game. So there really aren't that many times where you do need to explain stuff, but when you do, it can be a real problem. So you really should. Uh, tool tips are a great way to do that. The corruption, by the way, is a really cool biome idea. It's this stuff here with the purple grass, the dangerous thorns that actually don't hurt me very much anymore. Um, it's got special monsters, too. I really love the different biomes the game has. It really gives, gives it a sense of life. I especially love the corruption and the jungle stuff. It's very cool. But uh, this is Ebon Stone, and if you have a normal pickaxe, you can't break this stuff. And that's a problem, because at the bottom of these big chasms, there's usually a breakable thing called a shadow orb that gives really rare equipment. But a new player isn't going to know that. So, and they might see this shadow orb and they want to get at it, but they can't break this stupid gray stone stuff. And they may just give up. If they were trying to break it, this stuff, and you gave them a hint, oh, you should try some dynamite on this stuff, because dynamite does break it, that would just give the players a gentle shove in the right direction. If you do that only when it's needed, it can be really helpful. And you can really avoid a big, long, guided tutorial, because that's, that's a pain. But you can just give some simple tool tips when the player might get stuck. And like I said, for the most part, the game's pretty self-explanatory. You find iron. Turns out you can make iron tools with iron. So, and the natural progression is just um, copper, iron, silver, then gold materials. So you can make different sets of materials, so that's pretty fun, doesn't require much explanation. The Once you get to some of the more advanced materials, though, you start to not, it's not so obvious. Like uh, Hellstone, when you're down in Hell, 
If you don't have the right kind of pickaxe, once again, you can't pick the material. And if you don't know why, that can be really frustrating, and you're just like, oh, why would I go down to hell when there's nothing I can do? It turns out there is stuff you can do, you just may not know how to actually do it. And that's a problem. This is my pit straight down to hell. It's very fun. Everyone should have one of these in their homes. Just don't fall down it on accident. Lava, lava everywhere. Oh, I was not supposed to do that. As you can see, the falling damage can be pretty high. Apparently, even after you reach terminal velocity, I think it just keeps doing damage the farther, the more blocks that you've fallen down by. Which technically isn't how you work, how it works, but uh, it'd still be fatal, so whatever. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention. The game saves your game data in my documents. That's basically like breaking into someone's house and storing your crap in their fridge. Just like, oh hey, I have my own fridge at home, but I just intentionally thought I would inconvenience you by wasting your space and inconveniencing you for life by sticking crap where it doesn't belong. There is a folder in every Windows user's um, documents called app data. It's not usually visible. It's where save data and other program information is supposed to be saved for users. Please, please save data in there, not in my documents. It is so damn annoying when you have 500 games that all want to save their crap in my documents, and it's like, oh yeah, I don't have any actual work in my documents. I don't have like 10 freaking folders of crap in there already. Just go ahead and waste my space. But uh, this is Hellstone. It hurts when you touch it, and it actually makes really good equipment, but initially, you may not know that. And you may not be able to break into it. But, uh... The one thing most players are going to do is when they see a new material, at least in my experience, and... It does seem to be pretty common. You know, you see a new material, you want to get a bunch of it. The problem is, if you can't gather that material, you might think, oh, this is just junk. Sorry, the cats are being annoying. But, uh... Yeah, if you can't mine Hellstone, you should give a tooltip and be like, oh, you need an X pickaxe, and you're using a Y pickaxe, stupid face. You should use X pickaxe instead. Random money showering from the sky. Um, another thing that they seem to have done is... Um, I think they made Hell have a lot more imps. This makes Hell pretty damn annoying, which... You know, it's supposed to be Hell and everything. But, uh... I think the problem was that if you got to Hell really early, you could just get Hellstone and make the best weapons, like, right off the bat. But what they did was that you have to have the second best pickaxe to actually get at any of the Hellstone. Which, that really helps progression. This is a really long review. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the bosses in this game. One of the easiest ones... Not the easiest one, is the Eye of Cthulhu. Um, come on, show up. There you are. This boss I used to find really annoying, but they uh, cut its life in half, pretty much. I think it used to have 3,000 health for both forms, now it just has 3,000, period. I think it makes it a lot less annoying. Oops. But, uh... Yeah, it used to just drag on for freaking ever. And especially when it's shooting those eyes at you, it can be really hard when you don't have, uh... this brokenly powerful weapon. Let's use this instead, actually. It's so hard not to use the Muramasa, because, you know, what I was talking about with the having to click constantly, it just gets annoying. But the bosses are really fun. The problem is that there aren't very, very many of them, and by the end of the game, all of them are pretty easy. The one exception is Skeletron. Um, he's easily the hardest boss, and he pretty much forces you to have other players, unless you have like the absolute best stuff. Or if you use the star cannon, because it's totally broken. But uh, what I think would be cool for a balance thing for the bosses is if you have more players, either more bosses spawn, or the bosses are tougher based on how many players you have. Like, for instance, the 
the damage they deal or how much health they have could be partially dependent on the number of players that are around. Or maybe scale how hard they are to how much health the players have total. Or another thing would be, you know, if there's one player on the server, then you only spawn one boss. And if there are two players, maybe you spawn one or two bosses and so on. Because, you know, in multiplayer, you may have, like, ten people on. And it'd be fun to have, like, huge boss battles with either really tough bosses or just tons of... Tons of bosses would be fun, too. Oh, he's already dead. But, let's see what else did I want to talk about. Hey, zombies. The bosses are pretty fun. It's just that I would really like to be able to summon a couple of the bosses. You can summon the Eye of Cthulhu and the Eater of Worlds, but Skeletron and the Slime King are two bosses you can't spawn. In addition, there's also Goblin Raids, which are really fun. But they're so rare that it's like, I want to fight them, but... There's no way to encourage them. It'd be really nice if I could summon them or do something that makes them more likely to appear. It's like, usually bosses, you know, you should dread and stuff, but I want to fight them and I can't fight them and I find that a problem. Um, the game does sort of suffer from a problem where if you have the best stuff, there's really not too much to do. Um... That does give it some goals that makes it more fun to play as you're play playing it, but it really could have more to do once you have all of the good stuff, like my character here has. They A good way to do that was they have some vanity items that are pretty tough to collect. So if you have the best stuff, you can just try and collect these special items that don't do anything, but they re look really fancy. And so, you know, you might kill a bunch of bosses looking for some, like, there's a tuxedo and stuff you can get. Uh, the bosses don't drop the tuxedo, but the Slime King boss drops something. So that's sort of a fun thing to do. The building in this game is also really fun, by the way. Um, thanks to the 2D aspect, it's really simple. As you can see here, pretty much you just lay down the walls, and then you lay down the background. Um, it'd be nice if there are more materials to work with. That's always fun. Um, one thing I would like is a glass back wall, because I wanted like a glass dome thing here, but it looks just kind of dumb with no back wall. But building's pretty easy, which is very nice. Let's see, what else did I want to cover? Oh, the one problem with the bosses is that if you die, sometimes the bosses themselves die, and then they drop items. So even if you lose, you can still get the items, so that's a problem. And one of the bosses, the Eater of Worlds, when you kill it, it actually is still alive. Well, no, when you die, the boss is still alive, and it actually comes back to attack you after you respawn, which is kind of funny. Um, this game also does respawning, interestingly. Um, if you notice, when you vault your death... You just drop some money. You don't drop any items. That makes the game a lot less frustrating. It's still punishing you for dying because you lose half your money. But unlike some stuff, you don't lose any of your items. So it's a lot less frustrating. And frustration is a really good way to make sure that people hate your game. No matter how good it is. Lots of people will quit your game, trust me. But this game mostly does a good job of avoiding frustration. and It's a very fun little game, uh, especially for a random indie, indie game. It's done really, really well, and I highly recommend it. There are just some tweaks that I like to see done. This was a very rambling review, but I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy Terraria. I nearly forgot one issue with the game. So when you create a world, you have an option to make a small world, a medium world, or a large world. Naturally, the large world should have, you know, more stuff and more stuff to explore. But the problem with the large world is that it's really just the same stuff, just much more spaced out. The There are some floating islands in the game, and 
the large world just makes them almost impossible to actually find. It raises the ceiling for the sky for really no reason. There's just a massive amount of blank space in the air. The sky really doesn't need to be more than a couple hundred or two or three hundred blocks above the ground, I'd say. Because, you know, it's just a lot more nothing. And it makes it really hard to find these floating islands, which they're really fun to find and explore, and it just makes that impossible. Uh, in addition, it, the game only has a certain amount of certain things, like the dungeon you saw. In a large map, the, ma the world is twice as large, I believe, but it still only has one dungeon, and it still has limited amounts of certain things. So the large worlds are just less fun to explore, which really should... It should really be the opposite. There should be more stuff in the large maps. Um, what seems to be the case is that the world is just all the same stuff. The dimensions, the absolute dimensions, are just twice the size, I think it is. So, you've got all the same stuff. And the underground stuff is especially annoying in the large worlds, because... All of the caves and everything, they're just way more spread out, and so there's much more stuff that's just solid dirt. And there are, le there are a lot more dead ends, a lot less places to explore, it's just less fun. So the large maps really could use a lot of tweaking on that end. There was, on the wiki, there was actually a page about it, about the resource distribution. And, yeah, the caves are just really lame in the large maps. And that should really change.